Hi, and thanks for taking the time to watch this video about getting started with DataSwift personal data accounts and for spending time with us this weekend to contribute to Hack From Home, our virtual hackathon to solve problems associated with COVID-19. We're delighted you're involved. I'm Sean Yeager, VP of Sales. With me is Gus Markevichus, VP of Engineering for DataSwift. What we'll cover in today's video with Gus is how to sign up for a DataSwift personal data account, understanding the data access model and scope of access, that is to say how many applications can access the data in a single PDA. We'll talk about how to use the DataSwift APIs to read and write data to your personal data account, and then we'll provide you with an overview of the resources available on the DataSwift developer portal. With that, over to you, Gus. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Um, so without the further delay, I will get into, into uh, the presentation. I will start with um, by showing, uh, quickly showing how uh, we can sign up for a DataSwift uh, personal data account in, in our testing environment and start playing with the uh, API uh, as quickly as possible. So first of all, uh, you will need to head to uh, the following URL address that is uh, hatters.hololthings.com forward slash sandbox. And over there, we simply go to create an account. Uh, we need to enter our email address that we're going to be using. Uh, so I will just use one of my, my throwaway email addresses. Um, let's do test113 at gmail.com. Doesn't really matter. Um, uh, we need to come up with a username. Um, so uh, for this one, I'm going to use May the 4th, um, a very memorable uh, day of the year. And then if we just create a, a password, I actually have to copy password from my prepared slide. Here we are. So we I see just that a highly uh, secure password. Yeah. It is moderately secure password, actually. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what we actually use, we use this uh, library called uh, ZXCVBN, um, which actually does quite a um, unique way of verifying the strength of the password, um, which kind of tr it tries to guess just how difficult it is to guess your password. And based on that evalu evaluation, it basically produces the results. It takes into account things like that, like usually used words in dictionary and uh, all other kind of a stuff. So it's it's a bit more um, involved than just basically saying one upper uh, one uppercase, one lowercase, and one number in your password essentially, right? Um, so with that in uh, uh, in order, we basically we get to the last screen where we um, we see the permissions that. Um, our, uh, the application will have um, and because this is we're signing up directly for for a testing account um, we're signing up as the owner of of, of the hat and thus uh, as, as an owner we will have a full ability to control what happens on the hat and basically this permission screen just says that and if I click OK we go into the hat creation mode uh, so it takes a couple of seconds to actually to spin up the database in the background and create all of the resources required um, uh, for the um, for that particular hat. And here we go, success. So um, May the 4th Haba.net hat has been created. Um, so essentially, I've chosen May the 4th to be my username. Uh, and um, And because we're signing up for a testing account, all of the all of those uh, um, servers will be created um, under uh, Haba.net domain. And then the, act the actual subdomain will be unique to your username and it will match your username. So now, as it was created, basically, if I just uh, separately navigate to the following URL, maythefourth.haba.net, here I straight away um, should end up on the landing page with my hat ready. So basically, at, at this domain, now we have, um, now we have a fully functioning uh, personal website that has been created for you. And at the same time, uh, under this domain, we have the full API, uh, which will allow you to interact with a, with a server in the cloud. What happens behind the scenes is that database gets created. Um, this database is unique to, to your user. And 
On top of that, we create an API, which is again, can be reached through, through the following domain. And then through the interaction with API, um, you as the owner of, of, of the hat can basically make changes to, to underlying data in interacting with the database. And so Gus, at this point, what is a developer prepared to do next? Um, so at this point, um, we're basically the hat is uh, up and running and ready, and we can uh, simply switch over to Postman and try out um, um, several API calls just to see how it works. Uh, but and before, for those, Gus, sorry, yeah. for those not familiar with Postman, what does that enable us to do? So Postman is just the standard tool that we used to test um, APIs. It it might be any other tool that you're used to. It might be curl. It it, it might be um, HTTP, uh, HTTP, uh, whatever is your tool of preference. We just feel that Postman kind of gives the, the, the best, uh, um, um, provides best productivity to our teams. Terrific. So at this point, what we've done in setting up this particular Data Swift personal data account is we have instantiated both the data store as well as the endpoints for the APIs that we're about to call. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Great. Okay, let's get to it. Um, so separately, um, I will show you a demo of how this process would look from the perspective of the application. So this is how the process works when you want to uh, sign up directly for, um, uh, for the personal data account on DataSwift platform. But the primary process through which um, our partners are able to, uh, to provision um, uh, personal data accounts is slightly different and it's um, uh, much uh, less involved on the on the user side. Um, so I will just quickly demo that. So Gus, what we just covered is how an individual developer can create a personal data account. And I believe what you're going to show us now is for the purposes that is of testing and development, and what you're going to show us now is how once in production, an application can issue PDAs to individual users. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So the process for, uh, for uh, applications to issue PDA is, uh, sign uh, has significantly less steps than the direct sign up for a PDA. And basically we've, we've built this uh, interface to make it as simple as possible for the application to issue uh, personal uh, data accounts on behalf of the user. And in order to initiate that process, uh, essentially, the, the user's browser or, or web view, if we're using mobile applications, um, should be redirected to, to the following URL. Uh, that is essentially hatters.hubwallthings.com, services bass for back into the service, and a sign up service for that. Um, and uh, upon the redirect, um, the developer should provide a couple of query parameters. Uh, first of all, that's a hat name. Um, with which the hat should be created. That's essentially the username. Um, that username can be collected directly from the, uh, from the user by the developer. It's, it's up to the developer to decide how they're gonna do it. It's collected from the provided email. There are multiple ways to think of uh, how this can be um, uh, provided to us. Um, then we need an email address, which uh, ha uh, needs to be provided by the user and again collected by the developer and forwarded onto the signup page. Uh, then we need an application ID. So this application ID will uh, is basically um, an application ID that our platform issues to individual applications um, and then uh, sets the, the boundaries and permissions for, for, for that particular application. And finally, uh, redirect URI, uh, which in our case we, will be uh, just localhost 3000 uh, for demo purposes. So- Great, looks uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, and basically, if the, uh, once the user gets redirected to, uh, to this URL, um, they will be greeted uh, with the following screen. And on the screen, all the user has to do is enter a new password, hopefully a, a strong password. Yes, here we go. Um, and once uh, the password is in, we go to the next screen. Again, we see the permission screen. Uh, but in this case, the permission screen is uh, slightly different from what um, a hat owner would see, whereas hat owner has access to pretty much uh, all of the storage of, of, of the hat server. 
uh, a particular application will only have access to a particular um, uh, folder. Uh, and this is basically, this is specified in, in the uh, descriptive manner to the user, basically for them to see what kind of uh, um, access uh, a particular application will have, right? And, and so what uh, I understand, sorry, guess what I understand here is that as opposed to me individually as a user, or perhaps me individually as a developer signing up for a personal data account, what we've just seen is as a an application issuing a PDA, that issuer, that initial application, has a first set of rights to a namespace that they are using within the PDA. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, yes. Okay, great. All right. And uh, one, once we, you know, once the user um, uh, decides that they're happy uh, to continue, uh, they click confirm, and again we go into the mode where the ad get in the background. Um, so um, basically, the ad did get created behind the scenes, uh, but because I I I have local ho I'm pointing to localhost 3000, and there is nothing running uh, on my local machine right now. Uh, I'm getting this error screen, but if you actually pay attention to to the response. I got redirected back to the localhost 3000, uh, and I have a, a new query parameter attached, which is uh, named token, and that returns a J, JWT token, and this is basically already a valid JWT token that can be used directly uh, in the interaction with the API, uh, and uh, and basically to start making API calls, reading, writing data, and doing all other uh, sorts of things. Um, and one just thing kind of perhaps to note here, Gus, sorry, is that uh, even though we've seen this error, uh, redirect error, that uh, to, to those watching the video, uh, it's probably worth noting that there is a local development environment on the way, uh, not quite ready, but we'll be uh, shipping that soon, where individuals can download the HAT micro server and uh, develop locally to their machines, correct? Yes, that's true. And let's have a quick look at the JWT token that is returned. Um, so uh, as you may know, JWT token encodes within itself um, uh, various, uh, can encode various kinds of information. Uh, and one particular uh, piece of information that is important to us in this case um, is actually is the issuer of the token. The issuer of the token will actually have the, um, the domain name of the hat uh, that issued the token. Um, and this is basically, this is the way for, uh, for the developers to know where does that API, that, that cloud API was created and how they can now start interacting with that API. Because now uh, looking at the token, uh, we are able to tell, um, tell the domain name and where we should go and look for the hat uh, server. Uh, also, also, as an additional point of information, it also um, records the application that issued the token, and that basically that ties in the token with uh, with any particular permission set that has been uh, granted to, to an application. That is documented at resources.dataswift.io. Uh, so, as we got a couple of hats created, let's try this out. So now, now we're gonna get Postman. Uh, and how we can start making API call directly um, uh, to a hat using Postman uh, uh, Postman tool. Uh, obviously, uh, feel free to use whatever tool um, you like for for testing out the API calls. Uh, and uh, and then um, when, once once the development starts, you can basically translate those into kind of uh, code and and how you want to your logic to work. To start with, uh, let's let's grab um, let, let's grab an owner's token. So what owner's token does is basically it allows the owner of the hat to directly access um, all of the information stored on their database. Uh, as as you've seen before, I've created a new hat called May the Fourth, um, which sits under uh, May the Fourth dot uh, dot net, uh, and that's where the API can be reached. So now I need to log in, and in order to log in using um, using API tools, I would need to provide username as a header, uh, and the username will be simply be uh, May the fourth, um, the username that we created, and then obviously I need to provide the password, uh, which was Trooper Hands Lightsaber, 
So if I make this AP, get API call, um, here we go, I get access token returned to me. So this is an owner's access token. And what it allows us to do is to basically to access any, um, uh, any namespace uh, on the hat. So how does the namespaces work? Basically, each application that gets created on a particular server will have an associated unique uh, namespace. An application can uh, store as many, uh, create as many different endpoints. Any kind of a, uh, interaction with that namespace is basically limited uh, to the owner and the application itself. So because currently uh, here I have an owner's token, I can simply go into, um, into testing namespace. So uh, this is uh, as simple as basically just some a API prefix. Then our, uh, my namespace is here. Um, it's called testing namespace. It has been specifically configured for this application um, uh, that, that I'm using for this demo. And uh, let's say I have a profile endpoint within the namespace, which is completely arbitrarily chosen by me. In the headers, I have XAuth token header. If I just uh, insert the token that I've got from the previous response, and I make the API call, you will see that I, uh, uh, what is returned is an empty array. I haven't put any data into this namespace, so obviously there is nothing in there. Uh, so how do we create data? Well, we just need to make an API call to the same endpoint, but instead of a uh, get request, we just need to make a post request. So again, I'm gonna switch to the post request, um, insert an XAuth token, um, that I've received in the initial call. Uh, I make the post request. So just to check, let's see. So um, I have a body. Uh, so um, I'm basically what I'm doing, I'm sending um, uh, a JSON payload and any kind of a data structure that, um, that is uh, JSON encodable can be, um, can be written into the hat. Um, uh, there is no uh, predefined requirements of you know, like what kind of a structure, uh, what kind of a structure should be used, any kind of a predefined schema that needs to be used, basically, as long as it's a valid JSON uh, object or an array um, of objects, those can be sent into the hat and recorded, uh, and they will be recorded in, in the hat, um, properly indexed, and uh, and the data will be created. Right. So if we make the API call, okay. We get uh, 201 created um, and uh, um, the hat just echoes back the, the data that we have created back to us. So we can see that data uh, with the name Star Trooper and uh, its date of birth has been created. Now, if we go back, this is again the, the get request to read the data from the, from the particular endpoint. If I do it now, you will see that actually now I have this record returned uh, back to me. If, if we want to post multiple records in bulk, we can also do that simply by passing an array in the body instead of, um, instead of uh, just a, a single a singular object. So we could uh, add another object and we can say name um, demo and date of birth. Uh, what is the day today? 1st of April, here we go. So 01, 04, 2020. Okay, let's make another API call. Uh, oh, actually I almost uh, made a mistake here. So um, basically because this object has already been created under, under the given endpoint, um, it would be considered a duplicate and uh, the hat actually will, will reject this post request and, and will uh, throw an error uh, ba uh, back as a response. Uh, and this is because it does not allow duplicates in the same endpoint. So I need to modify this one slightly as well. Let's just change the date by one day. And if I make this API request now, we will see that I get uh, two, uh, two record, records successfully written and echoed back to me. If I try to read again, we'll see that now I have three different records within the same endpoint 
all written and, and stored in, in the hat itself. Okay, so this is, this is what happens when you're actually, you are the owner. Uh, essentially, you can create arbitrarily, um, go to different namespaces, to different endpoints, and basically investigate all of the data that is stored in the hat. However, as an issuer of an application, uh, your application would be getting um, a token, and that token has um, a limited scope of what it can do on the hat and the namespaces that it can access. Um, so I will just quick, quickly uh, create an appropriate token for an application, which I want to demo. So uh, the first step that I need to do is actually I need to set up the application. Uh, and once that is done, I need to get an access token for a particular application. So this is actually the process that happens behind the scenes when, um, uh, when that uh, sign-up process is happening for, uh, for third parties uh, issuing um, personal data accounts on behalf of their users. Uh, so what usually is getting returned then as a, query, uh, as a token query parameter is actually the following token. Although on the surface, it looks quite similar. In reality, it will have a quite different uh, set of, um, of permissions. And now if I go back to, the, to my uh, get request, where I'm trying to read data from testing namespace pro, uh, forward slash profile, um, and I will paste in the new token in here. I will try to read data. Well, it still works. Because, and why does it work? It does work because um, application uh, is currently configured to access, access this particular namespace, which is a testing uh, namespace. However, if I would change the namespace to, let's say, Star Wars profile and try to do a GET request from that namespace, what I'm getting back is 403. My, my application is forbidden to access this um, uh, this other namespace, whatever might reside behind it. Um, and we would need to use a, a separate special mechanism in order to access data stored um, on namespaces that are not, um, are not approved for my, uh, for my application. Uh, uh, we have this separate mechanism, it's called data debits, and um, we, will, we will be diving into it at the uh, at a later point, or we can uh, have further discussion of how they should be used um, on Slack channels. Uh, but yeah, but we have the tools that um, uh, allow developers to access uh, um, data in other namespaces in a specific way. That basically concludes my, um, my API uh, demonstration. It's a really quick demonstration, just a few endpoints to, to just basically get you started. But obviously we, we have a lot more things going on and a lot of th more things that can be done with the HAT API. Um, so I'm inviting you to go to the API huballthings.com domain. Uh, there you will be able to find the full Postman collection um, on all of the API that personal data server actually has. You can download the, the collection uh, into your local machine. And if you have Postman installed locally, um, it, it will allow you to just quickly test out all of these endpoints. So we have like, actually we have uh, a bunch of different endpoints doing uh, different things. And you can just investigate of uh, all of the richness of the API of the hat. Uh, furthermore, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, 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 FAQs and, and questions and answers and general documentation on how to use uh, uh, HAT and data, data Swift platform APIs. So I invite you to go to resources.dataswift.io and here uh, you will be able to find uh, a lot more information about um, how our platform is built and, and how, uh, how best to use it. I think that Fantastic. pretty much covers of what I wanted to say today. Okay, great. Thanks, Gus. And what we've gone over today, just to recap, is how to sign up for a DataSwift personal data account as an individual, as well as how applications issue PDAs. We've looked at the many-to-one data access model, including the scope of access. 
We've looked at how to use the DataSwift APIs, the endpoints that are created at a basic level to read and write data to your personal data account, and where to go for more information to learn about all of the endpoints and APIs that are available. So thanks again, Gus. Thanks to you as the viewer for taking the time to spend with us. Don't forget to join us this weekend, April 4th through 5th, for Hack From Home. You can learn uh, all of the details and a great deal more information at hackfromhome.com, including how to join our Slack channel if you're not already there. And with that, we'll see you this weekend.